let's start, I will invite you, dear friends, to pray with me as we ask for the blessing of God. Father in heaven, thank you for being with us. Thank you for sustaining us. Today as we study your word, bless us in a special way. Grant us the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. And may you forgive us when we have sinned in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. study about city life, dark liver in Africa. <laughs> can you now turn our Bibles? Can you please press? Can I, I need, I need, I need that pointer. Okay. Can you press? Okay. That's what we are trying to unpack. But I don't think we'll be able to cover and finish everything tonight. So I will take, I will do what they call a yeah. Uh, yeah. So we are going to look at the origin of cities. That's part one. Part two, we are going to look at the antediluvian cities. The cities that were built before the flood. Are we together? And then we are going to look at the cities that were built after the flood. And lastly, we are going to look at a, a, we are going to look at an example of our modern cities. Our modern cities. Can I please have a point? Sure. It's difficult. Can you then move the PC? Because I've memorized my notes. Can you please forgive me? I've memorized my notes like this. Okay. Right? Yeah, then that's better. Let's quickly look at our cities. For years I've been given special light that we are not to center our work in our cities. Why was she saying this? What, was, what, what is the condition of cities? We are told that in cities we have turmoil and, turmoil and confusion. And this turmoil and confusion is brought about by what? Labor unions and strikes. That is what causing the cities to be in a chaotic state. So this is what you find in our cities. Is it not true? Always running like you're trying to meet deadlines. This is what you find in our cities. You have labor disputes. People are negotiating for better salaries. Others are complaining that they are not paid enough. Others are also complaining that they are being robbed of their salaries. So this is what you find in our cities. We're going to cover this. Now let's quickly define our cities. Our cities, we can define them as a hotbed of iniquity. Read of time to read it, but you can get the statement from later. There are also hotbeds of vice. Let me explain this very quickly. The world over, cities are becoming hotbeds of vice. On every hand are the sights and sounds of evil. Everywhere you go in our cities, you just hear and see evil. You are just vexed as you move from your house to work or any other place. That's the condition of our cities. I challenge you, if you can go to the villages just for six months and come back to the cities, you will be so stressed when you come here. This is what we find. Now let's look at part one. Question is, is this what God is, what, is this what God had in mind? Or who is responsible for all this confusion we find in our cities? Let's quickly look at the original city builders. Who built the first city? Without looking there, who can tell me? Who was the first person to build a city on earth? 
quickly go to the book of Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4, this is a very deep study. Please follow with me. I will try to move very fast. Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. The Bible says, And Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was the keeper of sheep, but Cain was the tiller of the ground. And in process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the first things of his flock, and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his what? Offering. Remember the story of these two brothers, Cain and Abel. Now let's go to verse 8. And Cain talked with his brother Abel. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and did what? And slew him. This is the very first human murder that is recorded in the Bible. A brother killing a brother. This is the very first persecution. The future lectures will cover this. And the Bible speaks of an individual by the name of Cain. Now let's follow the story very quickly. The Bible says then in verse 9, And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood cried unto me from the ground. In other words, Cain's hands were filled with blood. Let's read verse 13. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass that everyone that findeth me shall slay me. Now let's read verse 16. And Cain, listen to this, went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod, on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch, and he built a city. This is the first person who ever built a city on earth. The first person, the first city which was built on earth was built by a murderer. The first city which was built on earth was built by somebody who departed from the presence of the Lord. Do you see it? But the question is, let me ask you a question. The Bible says he departed from the presence of the Lord. The question is, can you really depart from the presence of God? In the book of Psalms 139, the Bible says, God sees our thoughts from afar off. He knows our down-sitting and our uprising. Are we together? When I go to the sea, the Lord will find me there. When I go to the heavens and make a dwelling place or a hiding place, God will find me there. In other words, God is omniscient. Not only is God omniscient, but God is omnipresent. You cannot hide from the presence of the Lord. But the Bible is telling us here that Cain departed from the presence of the Lord. What does it mean? In Genesis 3, you remember the story, the Bible says in verse 8, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. In other words, God announced his presence to Adam and Eve by speaking. Are we together? So when it says Cain hid himself from the presence of the Lord, it means he made a voluntary choice to depart from the word of God. If it's clear, you please say amen. amen. He left his family. He left his father. He left his wife. Not wife, mother. And he left all that was promised to Adam and Eve of the plan of salvation, the plan of redemption. Let's quickly analyze this city builder, which is Cain. Okay, let's look at the characteristics of Cain. 
We have learned so far that he was a, a man that are we together. Number two, Cain was filled with anger. Number three, he was filled with the hatred. And if you can combine all of these things, they are equal to, to envy. Do I have time to prove all of this? So this is the character of Cain. Okay, repetition, repetition, repetition. We go there. We have to read first John chapter 3. Can you please go with me there? First John chapter 3. <clears throat> First John chapter 3, I have to take you through this. Let's read verse 12. If you're begging to say Amen. Okay, the Bible says, Not as king, who was king? <clears throat> who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were what? Wicked or evil. And his brothers what? <coughs> Righteous. The Bible says Cain was of the wicked one. Who is the wicked one? It's Satan, right? Now let's go to the book of Acts chapter 13. We have covered this in the previous lectures. I'm just bringing your minds uh, back to them. Back to these teachings again. So Cain was of the wicked one. Acts chapter 13 verse 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 8 These are the characteristics or the attributes of the wicked one and his descendants. Let's read verse 10. Okay, let's read verse 8. And Elimas the sorcerer for so is his name by interpretation. For so is his name by interpretation, which stood them seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O full of subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? This is these are the characteristics of the children of the wicked. Subtle, as Satan was subtle in the Garden of Eden, filled with mischief, they are enemies of righteousness, just as Cain was an enemy of righteousness, because God showed Cain the way of righteousness, the way of coming or approaching the throne of God, that is through the sacrifice of the Lamb, are we together? But he chose his own way, and to pervert the ways of God. And the last part is to turn man away from the faith. These are the attributes, if you can study this thing very carefully, they were all found and centered on this one man called Cain. And now when he goes to build a city, he goes to that city to manifest that character. We're going to unpack them. Did you see them? We are going to unpack them. Do you see them? We are going to unpack them very quickly. So Cain was the first city builder. Question is, why did Cain call that city after his name? Do you see? He called it after Enoch, his first born. we together. Why did he call the city after his name? Let's go to the book of Psalms, chapter 49. Let's quick, very quickly. Psalms chapter 49. <clears throat> Listen to what the Bible says. The Bible says in Psalm 49, verse 11. Their inward thought is that their houses shall continue forever, and their dwelling places to all generations. 
They call their lands after their own names. Do you see it? Cain wanted his legacy to continue forever so that the next generation that is born can refer and ask, why is this city called by God? Who is this Enoch? Then they can refer back to him so that everything can be traced back, back to him. Are we together? Is it a wonder then why we have put Elizabeth today? Because Elizabeth wanted that port to be remembered years later. Is it a wonder that you have Pretoria? Is it a wonder that you have Grimstown? Because Graham wanted that town to be remembered by himself. Is it a wonder that you have Credo? Because Sir John Credo wanted Credo to be remembered. He wanted his surname to be remembered forever. <laughs> this is city life. And you begin to learn something here. An element of selfishness. Are we together? Everything is centered around the human achievements. Yes, I can call it that. This is what we begin to learn. They wanted their legacy to continue forever. So what can be expected from this city? Murder, hatred, anger, envy. In other words, competition. People who are living in the city must compete with one another. Compete in everything. It's like some, what we call survival of the fittest. That's city life. Character of Cain. Selfishness. We are, we are expecting selfishness in the cities. Apart from that, we are expecting subtlety. Subtlety, in other words, subtlety is, is another word for wisdom. But wisdom that is used, uh, corrupt, like that is corrupted. And mischief. Hatred of righteousness. Do we not find these things in cities? And lastly, in cities you'll find a perversion of the right ways of God. Now let me prove this very quickly to you. Remember Cain built a city, right? And he had a family by then. Are we together? Now listen to what happened afterwards in that city. Go to the book of Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4. <laughs> Let's read verse 16. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod, on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch. And he, and he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. Do you see it? Now let's read verse 19. And Lamech took unto him two wives. Now these are descendants of Cain. They are still staying in the same city. Are we together? This is what happened afterwards. Look at how they are perverting the right ways of God. Point number one. And Lamech took unto him two wives. Instead of one, they take two wives. So the family of Cain in this city introduced what we call today polygamy. Okay, let's read verse 20. Okay, let's continue with it. Verse 19. And Lamech took unto him two wives. The name of the one was Adam, and the name of the other Zillah. Listen to the next verse, verse 20. And Adam bare Jabal. He was the father of such as dwell in what? Tents. And of such as have cattle. In the city of Cain. For the first time, men decided to build houses for themselves. Apart from that, there were also... We'll cover this now, right now. We'll cover this, we'll cover this. Let's read verse 21. In his brother's name, and his brother's name was Jubal, he was the father of us, of all such as handled the harp and organ. So in the family of Cain, they were musicians. They loved the music. Do you see it? They will play this music in these cities. In verse 22 it says, And Zillah she also bare to Balkain, an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron. The sister of Tubalcain was Neymar. In other words, in this city you have the first metallurgist. People who use this gold to make different objects. Now read verse 23. Now listen to verse 23. And Lamech said unto his wives, Adai and Zillai, hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech. 
hearken unto my speech for I have slain a man to my wounding and a young man to my heart. Do you see it? Just as his grandfather did, the genes of his grandfather were still boiling and, and, and hidden in him. And when he was tried to the utmost, he then took a knife and killed a person. <laughs> this is city life. Okay. We said Cain is known for perverting the right ways of God. Are we together? Yes. They introduced polygamy. Okay, I'm trying to. Okay. Let's leave polygamy. Polygamy. We've spoken about housing, right? God said to Adam and Eve they must dwell in the, in the garden. That was God's original plan. Okay. <clears throat> Let's look at point number three. Okay, then I, have to, I have to cover this part. Because they are who they are, everything will be done with envy and competition. My house must look better than your house. This is what we have today. Listen to this. This is now years later before the flood. They employed the gold and silver, the precious stones and the choice wood in the construction of, of habitations for themselves and endeavored to excel one another in beautifying their dwellings with the most skillful workmanship. Do you see it, friends? This is what we are doing today. If my neighbor paints her house in December as a Christmas, I must also paint. This is what we are doing. Beautifying our houses so that you can excel your neighbor. Animal husband. Because the family of Cain is what they are. That is to pervert the right ways of God up together. Now there is nothing wrong in being, uh, what do you call it? I don't know, what's the other word for animal husbandry? To be a father, right? There is nothing wrong with that. But it's the mindset. They are known for perverting the right ways of God. Is it possible then that they are the ones later onwards who came up with what we call cloning today? Is it possible? Mixing seeds together to produce different animals. Is it possible that the reason why we have GMO here is because the mindset of Cain is being transferred to all the generations up until our time? Is it possible? Genetically modified food. Now there's a verse in Leviticus which I which shocked me that God actually spoke about this thing. And you want the people not to do it. Mixing seeds together to produce different things. Listen to what it says, Leviticus 19, 19. You shall keep my statutes, thou shalt let thy cattle, thou shalt not let thy cattle. Is that what it's saying? Thou shalt not let thy cattle gender with a diverse kind. In other words, you cannot mix different animals which are of different kinds. But they did it. Also, listen to this. Thou shalt not sow thy field with mingled seed. Are we together? Today, what people are doing, they are taking different fruits, different fruits of different kinds, and they are mixing them together to produce new fruits. That's the family of Cain. Their mindset. I don't know if you are following me. If you are following me, please say amen. Now, the Bible says there was I read this thing. The Bible says Zilah she also bare two balkin and instructor of every artificer in brass and iron. So these were the first people called Smiths. Today we call them metallurgists, called Smiths. Do you know that as time progressed? They employed their minds to make idols so that they can worship those idols. That's how they wasted their skills. This is what you have today. This is what they had. And then lastly, that's point number five. We said there are five points, right? And then lastly, music. <laughs> Let's read verse 20. Verse 21. The Bible says, And his brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of such as handled the harp and the ochre. Let me ask you a question. Is there anything wrong with the harp and the ochre? 
There's nothing wrong with together. These are musical instruments. In other words, these are musical instruments. By the way, Lucifer, God built musical instruments in Lucifer. Remember, from lecture number one. There's nothing wrong. But listen to this word. The word there, the me, okay? He was the father of such as handled the harp and the organ. Do you know what that word handle means? In the Hebrew, this is what it means. It's taken from a Hebrew word which means tofaz. This is what tofaz means. Listen to this. Tofaz means to capture. It means to manipulate. It means to seize. It means to capture. And it means to overlay. I decided to add, to, 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 to make that word the first word in bold there. Instead of playing the harp the way the harp is supposed to be played, they will manipulate the harp and the organ such that when it is played, you have to sin. They handle the harp and the organ. I don't have time to go through all of this. And then they produce what is called syncopation. Who has ever heard of syncopation? No one. No one. Okay. Maybe we're doing music, we'll study this a later, further. Syncopation. Okay. These are just examples of syncopation. Do you know that there were also nightclubs before the flood? Okay, not necessarily before the flood, but later onwards in the Bible. You know that you know that in the Bible there are nightclubs. There were nightclubs where they will play music and people get drunk. It's called the book of Isaiah chapter 5. This is city life. And after this we'll read Micah, Amos. This is the verse which blessed me. As I was reading it yesterday, I was shocked. Let's read Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah chapter 5. If you are there, can you please say Amen? Are you there? Now listen to verse 11. The Bible says, Woe unto them that rise up what? Early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, <coughs> that continue until night, till the wine inflame them. <laughs> you see it? Now listen to what will happen as they are drinking from the morning to the evening. Listen to verse 12. And the harp and the vial and the tablet and pipe and wine are in their feast, but they regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operation of his hands. Do you see it? This will be their experience as they are playing the vial, the harp, and all these instruments of music. And as they are going into these parties, this will be their experience. They will not even think about God. Now go to the book of Amos. This, <laughs> Amos chapter 5, quickly, Amos chapter 5. And as these folks will be singing, Amos chapter 5, oh, where is this chapter now? It's chapter 6, I'm sorry. Now listen to what the Bible says. They were playing the vial and the tablet. Do you, do you remember? Okay, now go to chapter 6 of the book of Amos and read verse 4. That lie upon the beds of ivory and stretch themselves upon their couches and eat the lambs out of the flock and cows out of the midst of the stone. Listen to verse 5. That chant to the sound of the vial and invent to themselves instruments of music like David. The Bible says they will be chanting to the sound of the viol. How do you chant to the sound of a viol? A viol means a musical instrument. I don't know if you get the picture. They will be chanting as they are drinking in these parties. Dancing, chanting. That will be the experience. And this is what we have in our cities. Not only in our cities, by the way, even in our villages. We'll cover this later. 
This is how the descendants of Cain perverted the right ways of God. Use that which is good. Use that which God had designed in the beginning. That man should use this gift of music to praise and glorify him. Satan imbued the descendants of Cain with this mind to pervert this thing. And this is what we have in nightclubs. Okay, how do we get here? Okay, I'll call it music. This is what we find today. This is what we find today. This is city life, my dear friends. Okay, I have time for this. This is what we have today. Why do and all of these things? Okay, we are finished with part one. Are you guys following so far? Yeah. Now we're going to go to part two. Who can remember what we said part two is? Part one, we looked at the origin. Are we together? Yeah. Uh, I don't think we'll, we'll study this. But part two speaks about the cities during the antediluvian cities. We are, the purpose of this was to zoom in the time of Noah, but we won't be going into it. But if you want to know more, please contact me afterwards. Now we're going to go to part three. Part three. Okay, but before we go to part three, let me just read a verse so that we can connect these things. Are we together? Let's go to the book of Genesis chapter six. <clears throat> Genesis chapter six. Let's read verse 11. The Bible says, The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the what? The earth. God says the earth was corrupt. The earth was filled with violence. The earth was filled with crime. Everywhere you go, you find crime and violence in the times of Noah. This is a time, my dear friends, when the mindset of Cain had spread throughout the whole world and men were building these cities. Let's go to part three. And God says, my spirit shall not always strive with men. Remember the verse, for his days is all his flesh and he only has 120 years to live here later, uh, more. And eventually God destroyed the antediluvians. And now we go to chapter 11. This is part 3. Chapter 11 of the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 11, verse 1. The earth is now at this point, I'm just giving you context, was destroyed by a flood. Do, do we still remember? Now in chapter 11, listen to what happens. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shina, and they dwelt there and they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Now who can tell me which word is being repeated here over and over again? Us, us, us. Do you see that human mind, that, that humanistic teaching? It's human centered. It's us, us. Let us make us a name. The same mindset which Cain had when he built that city and called the city after the name of his firstborn, Enoch, are we together? These people are having the same mind. And this language sounds very familiar. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I, I will be like the most high. In other words, my dear friends, when we see and read the language of these people, the only conclusion you can reach is they were inspired by the devil. This is 
the man who was leading this. We don't have time to go into this, but next week we'll be expanding this. This is the man who was, in, who was leading this, 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 this group of people. His name was Nimrod, you remember? That's chapter 10. Now, if you study history, Nimrod was a mighty, even the Bible says so in chapter 10, he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. If you can study what that word before means, it means against the Lord. And he managed to influence everyone in his kingdom to fight against God. And by the way, who can tell me why was this a rebellion? We call this a city of rebellion, remember? But why was it a rebellion? For this reason. In Genesis chapter 9, the Bible says, when God, when Noah went out of the ark, you remember the story? God then made a covenant with Noah. And after he made a covenant with Noah, in chapter 9, God told Noah, listen Noah, be fruitful and multiply and replenish and fill up the whole earth. Let me together. So it was in the purpose or in the design of God, as it was with Adam and Eve, that these people should spread and fill up the whole earth. Are we together? But now, the Bible says, in fact, in chapter 11, from verse 1, these people were obeying that commandment because they were journeying from the east. Do you see it? But then something happened as they were journeying, listening to the commandment of God, that they decided to settle in this nice, plain area, which we call today Mesopotamia. It was called Mesopotamia. That was a rebellion. God says spread. And Nimrod says, no, no, let, let us not spread. Let's stay here. So this is what we have. That's why it's a rebellion. And this is what we have today. Okay, let me make this statement. Then we'll pass this section. How much power can people have when they are united to cause God the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit to come down and stop their work and not send an angel. How much power can people have? That's the power of one. And this is what we have today. Towers. Okay. I thought I, I, thought I want to speak about this very briefly. Do you know that Nimrod I'll just speak about this, please forgive me. Nimrod, as they were building these cities, this city with the tower, they also constructed, you must go and you'll see it in history. They came up with this system of building houses. Listen to this carefully. This is how the houses looked like. The houses were clustered like this until there was no space. Before that, the cities, how they were designed, there was enough space, but they clustered them and they joined the house to house together. And apart from that, they built very small windows, one in one house. And this was their reason. <laughs> they want to stay cool because it's hot. No ventilation, no oxygen. And this is how they designed the houses. And for the first time, they had what they call house tops. I don't know what to call it, double stories. Yeah. So people can sit there in the house. Uh, yes. This is how the houses look like. My question is do we not find such houses today? Is our city planning not like this today? Where houses are joined, one house is joined with the other, with the other house. Where a small window is being made. We had these. Okay, let's jump this now. Okay, I'll speak about this woman and then we'll jump this part. During the same time, there was a lady by the name of Ninkasa. Who has ever heard of Ninkasa? No one. Now, this is who Ninkasa was. Ninkasi, Ninkasi or Ninkasa? Yeah, it's Ninkasa. This is how she looked like. Ninkasi was a, she's known as the goddess of beer. This woman, listen to this story. This lady, being influenced and inspired by the devil, this is what she would do. She would take the sogam, you know sogam, the grain, and she would crush that sogam, 
ferment it, I don't know how she would make it, and then from that soccer, she produced beer. What we call African beer. And now this is what she did to so that this thing can re, so that this thing can be carried over and the people will remember it. This is what she did. She would teach the young ones who are coming up in that language they were using there in the form of a song. So she taught the ingredients in the form of a song. I don't know how they were singing that song, but I'm just picturing. I have that song somewhere here that you, but they will be singing it. You first go to the field and you take the barley and you crush it and you, so they will sing it until everyone else remembers it. And when God scattered the people, these people left with that mindset. Others went to the north, others went to the east, others went to the west, and others went to the south. Egypt, they went down to Libya, down to Central Africa, and others ended up in South Africa. And today we have the legacy of Ninkas. That's where it is coming from. You can trace it. It's coming from Ninkasi, the goddess of beer, made of soccer. And then this is what the devil did with our modern age. He modernized this thing. He moved it from the villages to the cities. Same soccer, same wheat, same barley, and he produced beer. Still beer, even the other one. And this is what we have. This is the last section. I don't know if you guys are following me. If you are following me, please say amen. amen. This is city life. Mindset of Cain has been translated down to our ages. And then we'll look at our last example of city life. Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> Let's go to the book of Genesis chapter 30. Genesis chapter 13. Let's read verse 11. Can we read from verse 10? The Bible says in verse 10, And Lot lifted up his eyes, and behold, all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered, everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Now listen to the next verse. Even as the garden of the Lord like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zohar. That That's how prosperous Sodom was. I mean, when God describes Sodom, the prosperity of Sodom, he likens Sodom to the prosperity which Adam and Eve felt in the Garden of Eden. I don't know if you get the comparison. That's how much prosperous they were. Just to prove this point, like to affirm it, go to Isaiah 51. Just keep your finger here. Isaiah 51 verse 3. The Bible says in verse 3, For the Lord shall comfort Zion, he shall comfort her waste places, and he will make a wilderness like Eden, and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness, gladness shall be found therein. Thanksgiving in the voice of men. I believe this was their experience. The same thanksgiving and melody that Adam and Eve were singing in the Garden of Eden. That's the same melody. That's the same thanksgiving that was going on in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. But there was something wrong with this city. Read verse 11 of chapter, chapter 13. Go back to Genesis 13 verse 11. Then Lot chose him all the plains of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they gathered themselves the one from the other. Okay. Abraham dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent towards Sodom. 
He was not in Sodom, towards Sodom, just close to the town. And then verse 13 says, But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord, exceeding. Beyond the prosperity, the glitter, and the glamour of Sodom and Gomorrah, God could see beyond all this prosperity. And the only thing that God was seeing, apart from its beauty, was the wickedness of the people of Sodom. Who can tell me what was the sin of Sodom? These were the sins of Sodom. In this city you had homosexuality. In this city you had adultery, fornication. You had pride, gluten, and greed. We'll read the ones of pride, gluten, and greed just now. This is what God saw. That's Jude, the book of Jude. You'll find in the book of Jude. It's only one chapter in the book of Jude. Think chapter 1, verse 6. Yes. We're getting to this part. Let's go to the book of Isaiah 49. Okay, before you go to Isaiah, go before you go to Isaiah, let's go to the book of Genesis, chapter chapter 19. And a time came that God could no longer bear and 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 and, 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 and keep Sodom because of these sins. Now listen to verse 1. And there came two angels to Sodom and even. And Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them. And he bowed himself with his face towards the ground. And he said, Behold now, my Lord, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet. And he shall rise up early, and go on your way. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. And he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned in unto him. And entered into his house, and he made them a feast, and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. Listen to the next verse. But before they laid down, the men of the city, even or the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. Can you imagine this? All the people from every quarter. Just because you have visitors, just because you have foreigners, and they are gathering themselves together to do something to these foreigners. Read verse 5. And they called unto the Lord and said unto him, Where, where are the men which came into the, this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. In other words, bring them out that you may sleep with them. This is how they treated foreigners. This is how the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah treated strangers. They manifested a spirit of austerity and hostility against foreigners. These, what do we call this word? Xenophobia. Xenophobia, you can trace it back to Sodom. This is how they would treat strangers. Is it an accident today in South Africa that you have xenophobia? Now, if God could not spare Sodom because of xenophobia, what makes you and I think that God will spare Cape Town, Johannesburg, Jobek? Jobek, Cape Town, okay, it's the same thing, Johannesburg, and Durban and PE. What makes you and I think He will spare them if in the same cities you have homosexuality that is being promoted? In the same city, my dear friends, this is what you have. Let's quickly go to the book of Ezekiel, that verse I wanted us to read. <laughs> Ezekiel 49. Quickly. Ezekiel 16, I'm sorry, verse 49. 16, verse 49. Listen to what the Bible says. We are looking at the sin of Sodom and together. So we have listed one, we have read one, but we have listed many. One of them was xenophobia, we together. Read the next verse. Which verse did I say? 49, I'm sorry. Ezekiel 16, verse 49. Listen to what the Bible says. Behold, this was the sin of thy... Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. What was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom? Pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her. And she did not strengthen the head of the poor and of the needy. 
God says the sin of Sodom was pride. The sin of Sodom was fullness of bread. Question what is wrong with having an abundance of things? This is the reason. This is the only thing that is wrong. If you go to the book of Proverbs chapter 30, the Bible says, Lord, give me convenient food. Give me food that is convenient for me. Do not give me poverty, neither riches, lest I be full and do what? And deny you. These people had an abundance of resources, but by their works, they were denying God. They were denying the power of God. They were denying the mercy of God. And yet they were rich and they had an abundance of resources. And the Bible says they were idleness was found in them. You know what idleness is? Idleness to just we have nothing to do. We have so many holidays today. <laughs> holiday after holiday, Easter. Oh, holiday after holiday, long holidays. Have nothing to do. In fact, Ellen White speaks about that. Apart from the holidays, how is idleness manifested? Sports games, all of these things. And the Bible says she did not strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. Do you know what that phrase means? In other words, in Sodom, there was a great gap between the rich and the poor. The rich were getting richer. The poor were getting poorer. And those who were blessed by these resources were not helping out the poor and the needy. South Africa. It is in South Africa where you have billionaires and millionaires. While people are struggling to even find a place to cover their heads. They must find means along rivers and floodplains to build their shacks. If God could not spare Sodom, what makes you and I think he will spare South Africa? Okay, let's leave this. Bible says she did not strengthen the hand of the needy and the poor. Okay, we are left with 10 minutes and then we'll close our message. What did this mean? Remember Christ said as it was in the days of Noah and so shall it be are we together. And in the book of Luke, I think Luke chapter 17 verse 25 to verse 27, he says that as it was in the days of Lord, they were eating and drinking, building and planting. And then I asked myself as I was studying this, these people were building and planting. What is wrong with building and planting? What is wrong with building and planting? Nothing, right? But now listen to this. Is it possible that while they will be building and planting, they will use the services of the people and not pay them. And then you had labor problems. Let's quickly go to the book of uh, Jeremiah chapter 22. Jeremiah chapter 22, quickly. <laughs> Jeremiah chapter 22. If you are there, can you please say Amen. I'll read verse 13. The Bible says in verse 13, Go unto him that builded his house by unrighteousness, and his chambers by wrong, that uses his neighbor's service without wages, and giveth him not for his work. These people were building houses. Thus, that saith, I will build me a wider house and enlarge chambers, and cut them out windows, and it is sealed with cedar and painted with vermilion. Shall thou reign because thou closest thyself in cedar, and not thy father, did not thy father eat and drink and do judgment, sorry, and justice, and then it was well with him. Okay, let's quickly go to the book of Leviticus chapter 19, verse 13. Leviticus 19 verse 13. Is it possible that these people were building these houses and not pay for the services of these people? I'm just putting it as a question to you. It might have happened, it might not have happened. Are we together? 
Just, but I'm just putting to you as a question. Leviticus chapter 19. Let's read verse 13. Leviticus 19 verse 13. Listen to what the Bible says. Thou shalt not defraud thy neighbor, neither rob him the wages of him that is hired. Shall not the wages of him that is hired shall not abide with thee all night until the morning. Let's quickly go to the book of Deuteronomy. Connect these verses very quickly. Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 14. Deuteronomy chapter 24, you can write it down, verse 14. Verse 14, yes, verse 14 indeed. In verse 14, listen to what the Bible says. Thou shalt not oppress an hired, hired servant that is poor and needy. Listen to this. Whether he be of thy brethren or of thy strangers that are in thy land within thy gates. Remember what was the sin of Sodom? She did not strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. Do you see it? Mm. Now listen to verse 15. And in his day thou shalt give him his hire. Neither shall the he Neither shall the sun go down upon it, for he is poor, and set his heart upon it, lest he cry against thee unto the Lord, and it be sin unto thee. Do you see it? Therefore God could not spare it. James quotes the same verse in the book of James chapter 5, and he speaks about the labor trouble that is coming to this earth in the last days. Because of this, Fraud. That's the word that James uses. James chapter 5. Yes, from verse 1 to verse 5. He says there will be fraud. People will hold back the money. And they will not pay the people that they have hired. And because of that, they will be crying to the Lord of Sabaoth. Not the Lord of the Sabbath, but the Lord of the Sabaoth. And God will hear them. But now the devil knew that prophecy. And because he knew it, he offered a platform for people to make their cries known by instituting labor unions. He created a problem and then he said there's a solution. Labor unions. Who is the founder of labor unions? Rev. to read all the statement. The founder of labor unions, my dear friends, is Satan. And what are the people negotiating and fighting about? Satan is busily at work in our crowded cities. His work is to be seen in the confusion, the strife, and discord between labor and what? Capital. People are complaining about their services. And they are also complaining about money. Now I have a personal testimony about this. This is what I'm going through as I speak right now. I forgot to do this. But it says, a few men will combine to grasp all the means to be obtained in certain lines. I don't know what's behind it, I'm sorry. Yeah, but it says, they will apply force, these people who are coming up with labor unions, so that their ends, or not their ends, so that their wants can be met. And then it says, men are seeking to bring those engaged in the different trades under bondage to certain unions. This is what we find. The time is fast coming when the controlling power of the labor unions will be very oppressive. Isn't it true? Now listen to what it means to be oppressive. Labor unions are quickly stirred to violence if their demands are not complied with. This was written in the 1800s by Ellen White. And this is what is happening. You have Anku, we have Satu, you have Kosatu. If these people strike, or before they strike when they are negotiating, and if their demands are not met, this is what they resort to. Violence, let us strike, let us break property, let us loot the shops. Christ said these things are going to happen. And unfortunately, my dear friends, as these strikes will be set up from time to time, this is what you will have. 
they will be responsible in hastening the time of trouble. It says, in every wicked mob, in every mob, wicked angels are at work arousing men to commit deeds of violence. I don't know who has ever heard of a mob spirit. Mob spirit. When people are marching in a mob, now Ellen White speaks of a mob spirit that takes over the hearts of those people. And a mob spirit, this is how it is defined. It is a supernatural excitement. And in that state of excitement, you want to manifest it by any hour. And you just take anything to manifest it. I don't know if you've seen a doi doi just going past you. As those people are singing, something is stirred in you as you're watching. You don't know what they're doing about, but you just want to join in. I went together. That's a mob spirit that is drawing you. Mob spirit. And Jesus was killed by this mob spirit. By this mob spirit. That's, what, that's what she says in these ages. Okay. This is what we have. And God says, no Christian should be involved in any labor conflicts. No Christian should be affiliated with labor unions. Because these are the same agents the devil is going to use to institute the Sunday law. You will cause a chaos that we have never seen on earth through these labor disputes. And a time of trouble, my dear friends, is coming before us. Time of trouble that has never been seen. Daniel speak about it in chapter 12, verse 1. And at that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince which stand for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered. That's the time of trouble that is going to come. And the Bible says Michael will stand up. You know what that means? That's the close of probation. A time whereby will never, will no longer be forgiven for your sins. And Revelations, I was reading it before I came here as I was traveling with the train. Chapter 15, verse 8, the Bible says there, when that probation closes, this is what is going to happen. There will be a cloud which will fill. There will be a smoke which will fill the temple of God. Because, his, because of his power and his glory. And no man was seen able to enter into the temple. No man was able to enter into the most holy place. No man was able to enter boldly to the throne of God. That's the time of trouble which will come. When the four winds of destruction will be released. That's Revelation 7. The Bible says God has placed four angels on the four corners of the earth. Holding back this force of winds. Winds of destruction. Winds of bloodshed. Something worse than HIV is coming. Something worse than swine flu. Something worse than Ebola. Something worse than World War I, World War II. Something worse than the Holocaust is coming. And these labor unions are responsible in causing that time to be hastened. A time is going to come because of these labor unions that we, society will just be unlivable. The world will be unlivable. In that when these guys decide to strike and they close down the roads, you cannot go to the shop. The shops close down because they are striking. You cannot go to the bank, they are striking and your money is in the bank. You can't do anything. You just stay home. And until the pangs of hunger take over. And you begin to starve. And you join the strike. And that will be a terrible time. And unless you and I as Christians have been preparing. This time will take us by a storm. It's just before our noses. South Africa, I love South Africa because it's a model of these things. It's being fulfilled right before our eyes. Look at the strike of Amku. Just last, last example, then we close. The strike of Amku. Five months. And people were being killed in Marikana in that five months. And people were marked men. As Ellen White said it. Those who do not want to join Amku and they are part of Noom, they were marked men. And they were killed. Every time you are seen with a Noom t-shirt, that red t-shirt, 
You were killed because this is uncle territory. Now these people are going to extend this territory and they are going to, going to go across South Africa and keep down. You will be a mad person if you are not part of Nehau. And it is Nehau who is responsible in staging a, a strike. Let's say they are staging a strike and you decide to wear another t-shirt. You will be a marked man and because you are a marked man you will be murdered. That's the type of trouble. These people have become more oppressive and they now have so much power. They chose a Matunjo, this uncle president. He has so much power. He's the most powerful figure as you speak right now when it comes to labor disputes. In the platinum belt where our economy is being engineered. So these are things that are happening in front of us. But my prayer is that God will keep us and sustain us, my dear friends. We ought not to fear. God says these things are going to happen. But we must look up and lift up our heads, knowing that our redemption is drawing nigh. Jesus is coming again. Let's pray as we close. Dear Lord, we thank you for being with us. Thank you for the lessons that you have given us. We have studied about Sodom and Gomorrah. We have looked at the origin of cities. We have tried, Father, uh, through the lessons which you have been giving us throughout the week. I pray that these lessons may be sealed in the hearts of your children. And may we be prepared in, in, indeed for these labor conflicts that are coming. In the name of Jesus we pray and for his name's sake we ask.